Test, one, two, three. Okay, uh, I think everybody can hear me. Uh, so sorry about that, we had a little bit of difficulty getting uh, the, the display hooked up. Um, but yeah, so this is gonna be a talk about implementing authorization. And uh, my name is Torin, I'm a engineer at a company called Stira. I'm also one of the co-founders and core contributors to the Open Policy Agent project. Um, so in, uh, back in 2006, this guy, Jeff Bezos, who's the CEO of Amazon, um, said that he thought that, you know, about 70% of software companies, or software companies spend about 70% of their time working on things that are not really core to their business, that don't actually contribute to the core value that they want to provide. Um, and he called that work undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, and so back in 2006, uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting for a software company, or a company trying to build a SaaS offering, was, you know, trying to rack servers to, in order to sell widgets online. Um, and so today, in 2018, you know, things are better. You don't have to, like, rack servers yourself. You don't have to worry about redundant power and whatnot. Um, you can spin up a Kubernetes cluster in a few minutes as long as you give your credit card to the uh, cloud provider. Uh, but I think that uh, today in the software industry, there's still a lot of heavy lifting that goes on. And I would argue that authorization is a really good example of heavy lifting that software companies do um, all the time. Now, the thing about authorization is that it's actually really important, and basically every application we build has to implement authorization. The problem is, is that, you know, if you don't get it right, the mistakes, or the mistake can be very, very expensive to recover from. Um, and so, for example, like if you're shipping an application to an enterprise, you better make sure that you have an auth uh, authorization story in place. Um, otherwise, there's no way that the security and IT departments at that company um, will deploy your software. Um, so what happens today is that, uh, you know, software companies basically bite the bullet and they do the heavy lifting and they implement authorization from scratch every single time. Um, but I don't think that uh, it needs to be that way. And so what I think we need to do is rethink how we implement authorization. Uh, I don't think that we should have to roll it from scratch every single time. Now, oops, uh, why, why is that important? So, you know, what this comes down to at the end of the day is that if you don't have to do authorization yourself or all of it yourself, uh, then you can get to market quicker, right? So you don't have to do that heavy lifting. And what this comes down to is the ability to ship secure, safe projects uh, quickly. So, you know, this talk is about authorization. And when people talk about security and access control and so on, um, they sometimes confuse or conflate these two things, these two ideas of authentication or authen and authorization, or AuthZ, or AuthZ. So authentication is the process of verifying the identity of the caller into the system, whereas authorization is the process of verifying that the caller has the permission to do the thing they're requesting. Now, it's important to keep in mind that you need to solve authentication before you try to solve authorization. There is no point in working on authorization until you've solved authentication. Um, it doesn't make any sense to write rules to control who can do what um, if you can't trust that, you know, Bob is who Bob says he is. Now, the good thing is that the authentication space is fairly standardized. So whether you're working in the enterprise with a standard like SAML or you're working in the consumer space uh, with, you know, OIDC um, or you're looking at using Spiffy in the infrastructure space, uh, there are existing standards that exist to help you verify identities. And while these standards, you know, represent information differently and they've got different protocols, um, they all do the same core thing, which is they verify the identity of people and machines interacting with the system. So authentication is all about taking credentials or something like that from a human or a machine and then verifying them. So the outcome of an authentication process is a verified identity. Now, in addition to verifying the identity, a lot of authentication processes will typically include um, attributes. They'll produce attributes as a result. And so these attributes are useful because they provide more information about the caller. Um, they, they will also tell you how the caller authenticated. So maybe they used you know, a simple username and password, or maybe they went through a multi-factor authentication process. Um, they'll also tell you when that authentication context uh, is valid until. And so once you get all of these attributes, you can use them in your applications to implement authorization checks. But one of the problems that you run into when you start doing this is that you 
discover that the attribute semantics, the meaning of some of these attributes is not necessarily well defined. It goes way, they go beyond the scope of the specification. So like in the case of Spiffy, the Spiffy ID contains a URL and that URL has a path, but the meaning of that path is open-ended. It's up to the admin to define. Similarly, like in OIDC, the ID token, it contains a bunch of standard claims, but it also contains claims that are sort of standard, like the AMR claim that tells you how the client authenticated, um, but the meaning of those, some of those claims is not, are not well defined. And the, in the case of OIDC, ID tokens can also contain custom claims. So you don't even know the universe of all the claims that can, can possibly exist. But beyond just the, the universe and the meaning of these, these uh, attributes, there's a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is that at the end of the day, your application has to decide how identity attributes map to functionality and privileges in the application. So even if you could enumerate all the claims and all the attributes and you knew the meanings of them and they were all well-defined, you'd still have this problem of evaluating them inside of your applications. So, you know, what about OAuth, right? Um, if you go look at the OAuth RFC, you'll see that it calls itself an authorization framework. So, you know, does OAuth solve authorization for you? Um, the answer is not really. So what OAuth is really good at and what it does really well is it enables delegation. It enables you to grant an application the ability or the right to do something on your behalf. Um, now, I really like this analogy for, for OAuth, which is that it's like power of attorney for web and mobile apps. So power of attorney you know, allows you to grant someone else the right to do something on your behalf, right? It's like to sign legal documents, for example. So for example, if uh, Bob granted Alice power of attorney, then she could you know, go and open a bank account in Bob's name, or she could you know, open a mortgage or something like that at a bank. Um, but the important thing to keep in mind is that the bank still has the ultimate say or decision about whether or not to let that account be opened. So in OAuth, the resource server still has the ultimate say. So just because you've granted an application the right to do something on your behalf, doesn't mean that the resource server is going to allow it or just blindly trust what the application is requesting. Now there are parts of OAuth that do actually help drive authorization, like the access token. But again, how that access token gets applied is outside the scope of OAuth. They don't define it. They say the methods used by the resource server to validate the access token are beyond the scope of the specification. So this brings us back to this question. How does the app decide what to do with incoming requests and identity attributes and access tokens? And so this is what authorization systems aim to solve. So when you build a new product or project, you typically have to build an authorization library or a component or a subsystem. And that subsystem exists to answer the question, can identity I do operation O on resource R? So let's look at an example scenario. Let's say we're building a payroll app and that payroll app serves salary data on employees and we need to basically protect access to that data because it's sensitive. So it might have an HTTP API where you can do get on slash salary slash Bob and then you can provide some credentials. Um, and, and then it's up to the service to basically decide whether to allow or deny that request. So what we're gonna do is look at how you could implement a simple policy that just says that employees should be able to read their own salary as well as the salary of anybody they, they report to or rather that reports to them. So this is one way you could do it, right? Um, I think most people here can probably make sense of this code. Um, you have some application code and some authorization code. The app code calls into the authorization code and says, should this request be allowed? Uh, and then the authorization code has an interface that says, pass me an incoming request and I'll return true if the request should be allowed or false if it should be denied. And so in this case, it checks if the incoming user is equal to the employee ID, like as if the user is requesting their own salary. Uh, and then it also checks if the user is in the list of managers for the employee. And in those cases, the request would be allowed, otherwise it would be denied. So this is fairly simple. Um, is the job done here? I don't, I don't know, right? I don't think so, though. Uh, because this code raises a number of questions. So what happens if tomorrow someone from the security organization comes along and says that now, in order to access sensitive information, you need to make sure that clients have gone through multi-factor authentication? Or what if someone from the legal department comes along and says, in order to access sensitive, sensitive information, you need to be connecting from the same region where the service is hosted or where the data is hosted? 
Or how do you delegate control to your end users, right? What if the customer of this, this application says, okay, well, I want HR to be exempt from this, this rule. They should be able to see all salaries all the time. Well, okay, so maybe you could just go and extend that authorized function. You know, you could add like six lines of Python and, and probably implement all three of those. But now how do you roll out that change? You've just written six lines of Python and now you have to go through a complete rollout of your application, right? That's, that's pretty painful. But there, there are even more sort of challenging problems here. So like, how do you render the UI that this application serves based on the user's permissions? What we've done here is we basically hard-coded the permissions or the logic behind them into the application. So you can't repurpose that logic in order to decide which components to draw in the front end. Even more fundamentally though, how do you prove to somebody that the policy you've implemented is correct, right? If someone from the security organization comes to you and says, have you implemented this policy, what are you going to do? You're gonna show them tests maybe, hopefully you have tests, uh, or you're just gonna show them the code. How do you audit the fact that this policy is being enforced? And then if you think about this in the scale or in the context of a larger organization that might have hundreds or thousands of services deployed, written in dozens of languages with dozens of frameworks, how, how is a security professional supposed to come along and audit and make sense of, of the state of things? So what we want to have, what the goal should be, is to have a solution that solves this authorization problem for any combination of I, O, and R, and that can be enforced in any language, framework, runtime, or environment. Now, this isn't exactly a new problem. Like, we've, we've got tons of existing approaches to, to authorization. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is just sort of explain some of the common approaches. So, um, one of the simplest approaches to handling authorization is to create an access control list system or an ACL system. Uh, so ACLs are typically denied by default. They're controlled by a single administrator and they basically allow that administrator to create a table of rows that say, this user can perform this action on this resource. So ACLs are, are really simple. They're, they're easy to author. They're easy to like, understand if you're just looking at one or two of them. The problem is that in a large organization, this doesn't scale very well. Uh, if you can imagine having to be the person that configures ACLs every single time a new employee starts for every single service in your organization, you'd probably go crazy, right? No one wants to do that. So there are ways around that. Um, so one example is role-based access control, right, or RBAC. So what RBAC does is it, at, at a fundamental level, is it lets you group users um, with roles, and then you grant permissions to those roles. So for example, if you're building a payroll app, you would... Um, basically say that you know, HR is part of the, uh, has the admin role and they can do and see anything. Uh, regular employees just have like a view role or something like that, right? And so now you don't have to, you're not tackling the scalability problem very painfully. Um, but sometimes RBAC isn't enough and you need something a little bit more uh, fine-grained. And so if you look at a system like AWS IAM, um, you'll find that it's much more expressive than what you get with uh, with RBAC out of the box. So AWS IAM has a notion of allows and denies, or deny overrides. Uh, you can hang allows and denies off of users and groups, as well as individual resources. Um, and then it has concepts like negation and other built-in functions that you can leverage. And then going even further, there's this thing called ABAC, or attribute-based access control. So with ABAC, what you essentially do is you define the authorization policy using Boolean logic. So you write a bunch of ands and ors over a bunch of attributes to make a decision about whether or not to allow something in the system. With ABAC, you typically also have the ability to write policies over context or metadata that may be outside of the incoming request. And ABAC is also useful if you need to express more of a, a more of like a relational policy where you say, for example, that like a VM owner should be able to terminate or change the VM settings, right? So we've got these different approaches and we've got these applications and which one should we pick? Well, when you have to pick a, a different an approach like this, it's good to sort of evaluate the trade-offs, right? And so one way of looking at trade-offs for authorization systems is to kind of compare their ease of use versus their flexibility. And so ACL systems and RBAC systems are nice in a sense because they're very easy to use, but at the same time, they're not very flexible. Now, it's nice to you need to have something that's easy to use, because if it's not easy to use, people are going to bypass it. They're going to figure out a way within their organization to get around it. And then you've kind of defeated the whole purpose of having these systems in place in the, in, at all. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to have to build a new system you know, every time the requirements change or every time there's a new use case. So ACLs and RBAC are good for simple 
problems, relatively simple problems, but IAM and ABACR are better for more complex problems. Now, the thing is, is that today, a lot of the time when we pick an authorization solution, we go with like an ACL or an RBAC approach. Um, and that's because it's, it's relatively easy to implement, it's relatively easy for people to consume, um, and it's also gonna deal probably with the majority of your use cases, like say 80% of your use cases. The problem with those approaches is that they're not enough, right? So ACLs and RBAC and even IAM are not really enough. I can say with confidence that most people here that work for a large organization have probably had to deal, or these organizations have to deal with all kinds of policies that go way outside of what ACLs and RBAC and IAM can deal with. So anytime you have to, um, you know, enforce a policy based on time of day, or based on the, the source address, the source IP address, or based on some kind of external context, then ACLs and RBAC are no longer sufficient. And the problem is, is that if you only have ACLs and RBAC at your disposal, then what do you do? There's not much you can do. So this is what we set out to help solve when we created the Open Policy Agent project. So the Open Policy Agent is an open source, general purpose policy engine. And what that means is that you can take OPA and you can use it to enforce policies in any service, in any system, at any layer of the stack. So the way this works is that when your service, say, receives a request or an event, it executes a query against OPA and it says, should this thing be allowed? That's the query. And then what OPA does is it takes the policies and the data that it has access to and it evaluates them to produce an answer like allow or deny the decision that it sends back to the service to be enforced. So there are kind of two key ideas behind OPA. The first is that policy decisions should be decoupled from policy enforcement. You don't want to hard code policy logic, policy decisions inside of your service because it, because it, can, it becomes very difficult to uh, understand that policy and maintain it and deploy it and audit it and so on. The other idea behind OPA is that you should use a high level declarative language to codify your policies. And so what you want is a policy language that allows you to mix and match these different kinds of models. So you wanna be able to use you know, ACLs and RBAC when they are appropriate. But then as your use cases become more complex, as you have new requirements, you'd like to be able to seamlessly switch over to a more sophisticated model like IAM or ABAC. Um, now, at this point, I was gonna do a demo, <laughs> um, but I can't connect to the internet. And I don't think I can. Let me try here. Uh, all right, I guess I can try GitHub. Is that safe? If I go to GitHub, is that safe? <laughs> uh, I don't know what you're gonna see. That's not good. Oh, it's working, hold on. Uh, let me go to my GitHub, hopefully that'll... Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> okay, um, hopefully... So I was gonna do an interactive demo where I show some different policies and show them being evaluated by OPA. Because one of the nice things about OPA is that the language is designed to be very um, interactive. You can take OPA policies and you can load them up into like Visual Studio Code, for example, and you can just start evaluating them. You can select portions of them and ask, what is the value uh, that this policy would generate? So this is an example of a Rego policy, or of a, which is Opus policy language. And what I was gonna do was walk through a simple scenario where, you know, suppose you have this, this pet clinic, right? And there are pet owners and there are pet veterinarians and pet owners should be able to, you know, read pets and create pets and veterinarians should be able to read and update the details of those pets, right, their reports. And so this pet clinic has two users, Alice and Bob. Bob is a pet owner, Alice is a vet, a veterinarian. Um, and then the pet clinic service will provide certain inputs to the policy. So it'll provide three things just to start. The resource, the type of the resource. So is it a pet, a pet object or a pet detail object that's being accessed? The action, is it a read, update, or create event uh, or operation being performed? And then the identity of the caller, so either Bob or Alice. And so if you were to try to list the pets that an application had, um, you would do a get on slash pets and provide your credentials, and then that would get translated into input that would be provided into OPA. And so then the service would query OPA and ask, for example, for the value of petclinic.allow. And the value of petclinic.allow would be computed by OPA on the fly. And so in this case, what it's saying is that by default, petclinic.allow is false. 
But if ACLs.allow is true, then allow would also be true. And so we can go look at this other policy here, this ACL policy, to see what would happen, what's being done here. So this is the ACL policy. And so what you can see is I've done here is I've just listed all the actions and resources and users that are allowed to perform operations, basically, right? The, sorry, rather, the, the action resource user triplets that are allowed. So Bob is an owner, so he can read and create pets. And Alice is an owner, so she can um, read and update pet details. Or she's a vet, veterinarian, rather, so she can read and update pet details. Right? So this is really simple. Uh, it's only 27 lines long, but if you had you know, hundreds or thousands of users and many more operations, then it would become very long and very um, painful to work with. And so what you'd want to do is switch over maybe to an RBAC model. Um, and so what you would do is you would define you know, your standard RBAC uh, objects. You would define some roles. So for example, there'd be an owner role that could do reads on pets. And, there'd be a, uh, and it could also do create on pets. And then there'd be a veterinarian role that could do reads on pet details and updates on pet details. And then you would bind users to those roles. So you would say Bob is, has the owner role and Alice has the veterinarian role. Right? That's pretty simple. I think everybody can follow the YAML. And then what you do in OPA is you write a policy that can interpret that data. So here it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more complicated. But it basically says that allow is true if role name is in roles for user and role name is in roles for operation. And then we define some helper rules like to basically find the roles that match the bindings and match the, the sorry, helper rules that match the role bindings and, and, and role definitions. So this rule is basically searching over all the role bindings. That's what the underscore does there. And it's finding a user that matches the input user. And then it just generates that role name. Similarly, the roles for our, uh, operation rule is generating the set of roles that match this incoming operation, or requested operation. So again, we're searching over the roles. We're searching over the permissions on each role. And then we're checking if those permissions are the same as the one being requested. And so you could actually, in, in, in the VS Code plugin, you could select that portion of the, the policy and hit evaluate. And it would tell you, these are the roles that match the input that you've given me. And so this is what the input looks like. It's just simple JSON data. You can actually provide arbitrary JSON data to OPA as input. It's not coupled to any domain-specific model. Um, it's very flexible that way. Um, and then in order to make that take effect, in order to enforce that, you would go into your top-level allow rule, and you would just change that ACLs line to say rbac.allow instead. And now you've basically transitioned out of the ACL world into the RBAC world, right? Um, so I can just actually edit this, hopefully. Make this clearer? Sure. So you'd go in here, <laughs> and you would change this to rbac.allow. Um, now suppose that somebody came along, and or there, suppose there was a breach, right? And the company decided that you can no longer access pet details if you're outside of the corporate network. Well, how would you do that with RBAC, right? You can't refer to the source IP in, in an RBAC model. So what you would do in OPA, though, is you could extend that policy by saying add a deny rule here. Uh, so you, let me just uncomment this. I don't usually edit policy in the GitHub text editor. Um, but so now what this says is deny is true if the source IP is not inside of this CIDR network um, and the input resource being requested is pet details. And then in order to make this take effect, you would just go here and say, sorry, allow if not deny. So now the policy says basically, um, by deny by default, allow is true if rbac.allow is true and deny is not true. Okay? So this is just an example of how you can basically take um, a single policy language and then apply, apply it to solve different kinds, of, or apply it to, with different policy models or authorization models. So the question that comes up a lot when I talk about OPA, the Open Policy Agent, is you know, how easy is OPA to use? How flexible is it? And I've never run into a use case where OPA wasn't really able to describe the policy that people wanted to describe. But then that begs the question, well, it's too flexible. It's too hard to use. Uh, but I think this is kind of a bit of a trick question. Because if you want to just stick to simple ACLs and simple RBAC models, then you can do that. Right? I just showed that. Um, and OPA will, will handle that fine. Um, it'll actually do it in a fairly performant manner, like it'll, it'll, or a manner, it'll, re it'll render RBAC decisions for thousands of roles and thousands of role bindings in about 50 microseconds. So we have some powerful optimizations inside of OPA that, that make it possible to do that. 
Okay. So uh, the second, this, this, this is something else that I wanted to talk about, which is something new that we've been um, working on in OPA. And um, so, you know, we've built this pet details service or this pet clinic service, and it's, you know, it's serving requests for all the pets and it's got to store that data somewhere, right? So it's probably put that data inside of a database. And then whenever a request comes in to like list the pets, it runs a select query and it, it returns the data that's in that table. Um, but oops. so far, we've only talked about policies that apply to the incoming data, right? The data that's in the request. All we've said is that you can say, you know, Bob can perform get on slash pets. We haven't said how, you know, you would restrict Bob to only be able to see that, you know, the pet that he owns, right? Fluffy. So that's, that's the problem here, right? Like what if you wanted to enforce this policy that says that users should only be able to see the details of pets they own? Well, how, how would you implement this today? Um, what we would probably usually do, what we usually do is we go into that service and we extend it to tag on a where clause to that SQL query. And now when Bob requests, you know, slash pets, he's only going to see the pets that he owns. But now we're kind of back in the state that we were originally, where we're hard coding policy decisions into those services. What you kind of want to be able to do in the policy is provide constraints over those queries or to, to control those queries to some extent, right? So for example, if a new regulation came out that said you can only see pets from the region that you're connecting from, then you know, the policy could influence the query that the service is running. Now, so far what we've seen is that you know, when a request comes into the pet detail service, it'll ask OPA for a decision. Right? It'll provide some input, like the method and the path and so on. And then OPA is going to crunch the policies that it has, and it's going to return a decision like allow or deny back to the service. So it would be kind of difficult to, to, to implement this kind of policy today, right? Like you would need to somehow get the data from the database into OPA and then ask it every, for every single record or every single pet, whether it should be presented or not, whether it should be allowed to be seen. Uh, and it turns out that it's actually really hard to do that in a way that's both like performant and scalable uh, and maintainable and correct. And, and that follows like, the application's consistency model. Uh, because in order, so basically the problem is that in order to render that kind of a decision, OPA has to, has to have access to that data. Um, and so instead, what we're going to do, instead of um, moving the, the data to OPA, to the policy, we're going to move the policy down to where the data is stored. So the way this works is that um, it leverages a feature from OPA called partial evaluation. And what partial evaluation does is it allows the pet detail service or any service to ask, what are the conditions that should be applied to this request? And then when OPA runs and it evaluates the policy, it basically returns a very simplified form of that policy, just a set of conditions like ands and ors over attributes that can be easily translated into like a SQL where clause or appended onto a SQL where clause. And so this way you push the policy enforcement down into the database um, which means that the policies can be enforced in a manner that is performant and scalable and, and, and adheres to the consistency, re consistency requirements of the application. Um, so again, I was going to do a demo here, um, and I don't think it's going to be very compelling without a UI, but if you're interested, go to this repository under my username, and you can just run this if you want. Um, it'll, it'll show you how you can basically implement data filtering policies with OPA. So, um, if you're interested in more details about how this works, we have a blog post on blog.openpolicyagent.org that goes into much more detail. Um, if you're interested, I recommend you check that out. So the takeaway here is that authorization is heavy lifting, right? It's a hard problem to solve, but every app has to solve it in order for it to be successful and for it, in order for it to be secure. Um, hopefully, we can get past the point where everybody has to re-implement this stuff all the time. And so the next time you're thinking about implementing authorization, um, maybe think about it a little bit differently. You can check out the Open Policy Agent um, online. We have a bunch of documentation to help you learn about it. And we also have a number of integrations with all kinds of projects in the ecosystem. So it's not limited to just API authorization. You can use it for all kinds of things like admission control in Kubernetes, for example. Um, you can even use it at the host level with PAM and SSH and sudo if you want to lock down access on, a, on an individual machine. So thank you very much. Um, we have a Slack org if you're interested in policy and, and OPA. Check it out. Um, the code is online on GitHub.
And yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think we have like a minute for questions, um, but I'm happy to talk afterwards as well. Uh, the question is, how do you test the policies? Yes, so uh, normally we uh, write policy uh, authorization code. So um, we write unit tests to uh, ensure the policy mm -hmm. is correct. Yep. Uh, now you decouple this code, uh, policy code from uh, our code base mm -hmm. and into this uh, policy file. So how do you ensure your um, policy is correct? Um, so we have a bunch of like static analysis um, and semantic checks that you can run on the policies <laughs> offline. So that just does it automatically for you. But OPA also has a test framework. So you can actually write tests for your policies and then have them um, executed and, and verify that they're correct. So um, it turns out that when you're writing tests for OPA policies, the, um, they're, they're fairly easy to write. It's just pure logic over data. So it's, it's actually, a, some people actually said it's enjoyable. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it's very cool. Okay. Um, Question? And also like, how do you decouple routing logic from the Middleware. How do you decouple routing logic from routing. the OPA middleware? Can because, you explain? Uh, let's say like two different routes need uh, different uh, enforcement. Yeah. So how do you like? Uh, so you, what you, you so it? usually what comes in the input to OPA is like the path, for example, that's being accessed, and then inside the policy you make decisions based on that path, for example. So you can actually supply arbitrary JSON att like attributes into OPA. The path could be one of those, and then you could route based on that. Yeah, exactly. But then it's not decoupled with the application, right? Entirely. Uh, well, I guess it's coupled to the, a the public API of the application. Yeah, yeah, you can't get around that. Uh, okay, any other questions? Nope. Okay, well, thank you very much.